This is 15 Minutes to Freedom. I'm your host, Ryan Idell, and today's episode is Cut Out the Cancer. So today's episode has a little bit more of a somber tone to it. And to me, it's something that needs to be addressed. So I got a call. Actually, there's a series of text messages. Middle of February of this year. And it was from a good friend of mine. This good friend lives on the West Coast. This friend and I have stayed in touch. You know, we have had businesses together and worked together and just a phenomenal human being. Actually, so much so that this, this individual is going to marry Lindy and I out in Venice Beach in three days. And this individual is messaging me like, man, I just don't really feel well. How are you? You know, just catching up. He says, man, I just, I've been, and I'm asking him the same question. He eventually says, like, I've been under the weather. And you can probably guess by the title of this episode where this is going. And so he says, man, I get him on the phone and he tells me, look, Ryan, like I've, I woke up last night and went to the bathroom in the middle of the night, just had to go. And it was, there was blood everywhere, literally both ends of my body. And so I have to go to the doctor. Yeah, you know, okay, no big deal, buddy. I'm not a medical guy. So this doesn't mean much to me. Obviously, I know you're not supposed to have blood in your urine or in your stool. Like, I'm, I'm intelligent enough to know that's a bad sign, but don't know anything about it. And so in this, he eventually messaged me and later in the day and says, look, we got to talk. And he can't bring himself to call me on the phone. So it ends up being through text message. And he says, look, I've been diagnosed with stomach cancer. And the stomach cancer is aggressive. And I'm still a little naive to this. So he hasn't had the staging test done yet. This is all shock. He's by himself. He's in a hospital, like I said, out on the West Coast. And he's sharing these text messages with me. And at this point, I'm one of two people that know. His mother and myself are the only ones that know. And, of course, I share with Lindsay. And at that point, Miles, is, is he was still around. And, you know, I'm devastated by this. Like, I'm helpless. So a couple days progress, and he eventually gets the staging results back. And the staging results come back that he's got stage 4, advanced stage 4 stomach cancer. And this stage 4 stomach cancer is spread. It's not just in his stomach. It's all throws lymph nodes in his spine. And his, basically his body is riddled with this cancer. And so in this, this friend of mine is faced with his own mortality. And I know something. I, he shared this with me. I, I know from text message. And all I want to do is get him on the phone. So I want to hear his voice. I want, to, I want to know where his mind's at. And he's not ready to have those conversations yet. So a couple of days pass. I consistently reach out and call him and try to talk to him. And there's no answer. Now, he'll respond back through text messages. And he says, you know, I'm still in the hospital. I'm figuring some things out. Eventually, we finally get to speak. And as we speak, I'm driving in the car. It's raining outside. I have Lindsay in the car with me, and he's on speakerphone. And there's just this overwhelming sense of hopelessness, this desperation. You know, he's he's crying almost to the point, as we both are, that we can't understand what the other one's saying. And I'm trying to be strong and stoic because, Lord knows, the last thing you want when you're facing your own mortality is the fact of other people to cry next to you. So I'm telling him, look, like we'll figure this out. We're going to, there's a way around this. There's always a way. I mean, I believe that so much I have a tattoo in my arms. I'll find a way or I'll make one. There's always a way to fix this. Well, in the back of my head, I know the whole time there is no way to fix this. You don't beat stage four terminal cancer. It, terminal means the end of your life. And so we eventually have to hang up the phone. He's emotional. He wants a couple days to, to think about things and call me back. I'm emotional. Hang up the phone. Can't hold together anymore. I cry, cry to Lindsay. You know, it's just... It's heart-wrenching. You know, I've known this guy for a couple of years, and he's one of those guys that is in his mid-40s, early 40s, that is such a high-quality, high-caliber individual that it doesn't matter where I'm at in the world, what I'd be doing. If I called and said I needed him, he'd be there. If we were driving down the road and he saw a homeless man that was shirtless, he would stop and take off his shirt. And that's not some sort of, like, bullshit, like, he's that type of guy. No, that's literally how this man is wired. Anytime I fly to a city, he extends me the offer to stay in his house, whether he's there or not. If I need cars to drive, if I need anything at all, he facilitates it. He's just one of those incredible individuals that deserves to share his beauty with the world for the next 40 years, and it's going to be cut short. And so eventually we we catch up, and we talk, and obviously he knows I'm getting married to Lindsay, and that's that's not a secret, of course. I said, look, I can't imagine anybody else greater than you 
to actually be the officiate for Lindsay and I. There's no more meaningful person on the planet that I could come up with than you. And he's humbled, and he's flattered, and he's emotional. And he wants to do it, but he, he admittedly in the back of his head, I have to imagine there's a whole bunch of reasons to why he's not sure if he should say yes. Because it's February, and our wedding is not until May. That's the end of February, and, and we, he asked for some time to think about it. And I'm like, man, this guy might not make it to May. Like, the cancer is advanced. And if he doesn't make it to May, he doesn't make it. Like, what does that look like? What does that feel like? What if he dies? What if he passes while we're supposed to be getting married? Like, what do I do? How does this all work? I don't have an answer. Like, there's no playbook for this. There's no anything. This is just raw emotion going through me. These are thoughts that are racing around in my head that I have never asked Lindsay if she felt the same way, but I have to imagine that some of the same. Like, what happens? So he waits a couple days and he calls me back and says, I'll do it. I would love to officiate your wedding. Now, granted, he's not a minister. He has to get ordained, and he's, he's done all the necessary steps as of right now. You know, we, we spoke to him multiple times this week. But in that, we have a series of additional conversations. I ask him, you know, what are you going to do for treatment? Like, what is the plan here? Do you have a plan? How does this work? He says, no, Ryan, like, I got to look at it like this. Whatever I do now is going to probably impact the quality of my life. If I go through with chemo, if I go through things on that side of things, I'm going to feel like shit for the last days I have here on this planet. If I don't go through that stuff, it might cut my life short, but I'm going to feel better in the meantime. So, Ryan, what I'm deciding to do is just go forward. I'm not going to cut out the cancer. I'm going to just keep things where they're at. And so I come up with a whole bunch of holistic opportunities for him. I mean, I do research... If it's hours, it's days worth of research and pouring over all this data to give him about all these studies that have been done on holistic ways to help minimize the effects of cancer. Get him set up with some people. Get him introduced to some holistic people. And he's on that path right now in his own right. But he was just point blank not willing to cut out the cancer. And I can't say I blame him. In my position, if I was in stage four terminal cancer, no matter how much I care about my family and and this podcast and life as a whole, I'm not going to subject myself to that same sort of punishment. I'm going to enjoy the last time I have left. But in saying that, it got me thinking, where in the world am I not cutting out the cancers in my life that I should? Because they exist. Like whether you have actual cancer in your body right now, or there's cancerous people around you, or cancerous situations, we all have cancer around us. I know it's crazy. Think about that, right? I just went down this incredibly morbid path. I'm going to lose my best friend probably sometime this year because he's not willing to cut out cancer. So where in life should I be cutting out cancer daily? And it started with auditing my circle. Auditing the circle that I associate myself with. Not even the fact of friends, just people that occupy the time and space in my mind. There's a gentleman out of uh, southern states. I'm going to leave it pretty, pretty agnostic for right now. And this gentleman just doesn't line up with me morally. Not a bad man, incredibly intelligent, successful business, has a family. But in this family, he's got a stepchild and a couple of his own kids. And he adores his kids, loves them, posts about them on social media, does everything the right way to the outside world. When it comes down to how he treats the stepkid, it's like the man doesn't exist. And the stepkid's, stepkid's father is not in his life. He's by himself. Out of any of the three kids, this kid needs more male influence. He's the oldest. He's probably the most socially awkward or, or backwards because he hasn't had a male influence that's positive that's poured into him the right way. So this man and I go back and forth and have all these conversations about business and what could we could grow together. But at the base level, I can't stomach the fact of thinking that I'm going to go into business with someone that could treat a child that way. So I'm auditing that circle, and I just know that's not going to work. Like something as simple as that. A deal that I guarantee I'll make seven figures on, I can't partner up with based off the way he treats people. Now, that's been a progression. If you would ask me that a year ago, I would be like, ah, fuck it, I can figure it out. I'll make this work. 
but I can't because energetically I can't afford to pour into him knowing that he's not pouring into other people. This goes back all the way to, to talk about the car business. I had a friend, Dominic, and a friend, Devin. And these two friends were just consistent womanizers. And not that that's, I, I got to say it, I, I think that's bad now. At the time, it was just what it was. And so we would all cover for each other. They would lie for me, I would lie for them, and that was just what was socially acceptable. But something ended up happening, and I broke up with an ex-girlfriend, and he started trying to sleep with her. One of those guys did. And I just stopped for a second. I'm like, look, this guy isn't really a friend. This guy's an opportunist. As I've made more money and advanced in my life, I've been taking care of this guy by either getting him a job or paying for trips or paying for dinners. Like, these are people that I'm now taking care of. They're almost on my fucking payroll, and they're ready to stab me in the back. Like, these are not friends. These are just people. So they're out. Pick up the phone, have a tough conversation, and say, look, you did X, Y, and Z to me. You tried to sleep with my ex-girlfriend. It sounds cliche in the moment now, but at the time it was monumental. I'm like, if that's the quality of person you are, this is the last time you're ever going to hear from me. Oddly enough, that was more than three years ago. Haven't heard from him since. No, I won't ever hear from him. He doesn't line up with where I'm at. It's not that I don't consider giving people second chances. Like, that's fine. But the quality of a man is determined by the actions he takes when no one's watching. And those actions matter. Like, the details matter. Like, if people are around you and don't share the same mindset you have, you should pay them no mind at all. So you have to look at it. Let's say you're... We'll talk about the the relationship side of things. I'm not going to hang out or associate with people that think it's okay to cheat on their significant other. Moreover, if I see them start to go down that path versus how I think now, I'm going to pull them aside and say, look, I went down that path. Don't do this. There are negative ramifications to falling down this path. They might not want to hear it, but I sure as shit wish someone would have cared enough about me back when I was being an asshole to sit me down and grab me by the back of the shirt and say, like, look, motherfucker, stop this. Like, you're hurting people. You're hurting yourself. Like you're better than the actions you're portraying to the world. But the people I was around were enabling the behavior. Nobody wanted to tell me to stop. What if it's in business and everybody, you're surrounding yourself with people that are around the water cooler at lunchtime, all saying like how bad the boss is and how miserable the job is. All you're doing is by association, pulling yourself down. Like those are people that aren't going to get you to the next level of the, the ladder you want to climb to. You want to be in management? You want to own your own business? You think that associating with people that talk shit about who they work for, who signs their check, is going to get you anywhere? Moreover, what happens in today's society is most people are afraid to stand up to those people. Most people don't want the social ridicule. I'm sitting down and saying to somebody like, look, I don't agree with your mindset. I don't want to hear it around me. Leave me out of those conversations. Because that necessary conflict is super fucking uncomfortable. I've been guilty of it for years of not wanting to have those conversations. And I'm okay if you don't like what I say. We should have a healthy conversation say, look, I don't like how you cuss all the time. Okay. Well, what the fuck are we going to do about it? Are you in or are you out? Because if you're in my company and you associate with me, like those are words that come out of my mouth. We have a choice. You can continue to work and I can do my best to temper that, that behavior around you. I'm not going to change who I am authentically. Or I can offer you a position at another company that doesn't have anything to do with mine, meaning I can basically fire you. Like, that's life. It doesn't make me a bad guy or the person that would be saying that a bad guy. That is just the way the world works. Instead of going home, that individual, not that there is one, but hypothetically, that individual going home and talking to his wife like, man, this guy's just, he's crazy. He cusses all the time. You know, he's, he's just, he's unstable. He's bipolar. You know, he's a sociopath. I've heard... It's crazy from having these podcasts and having videos online and just sharing content. I've heard everything under the sun from people about how my personality must be. That I must be literally all of those things. I've heard that I'm a sociopath. I've heard that I have split personalities Why, because I get passionate and I, I, I say fuck or shit. Yeah, I cuss. Like that's part of it. But I do it for expresso purposes. But if you don't like that or you're in my social circle and that offends you, have the decency to talk to me about it before talking to everybody else about it. Now, how often do you do that, though? You know, you think about it, it. These situations don't go away overnight. They didn't create themselves overnight. They're sure as shit not going to go away overnight. So you have to audit these social circles. You have to audit the people you're around. You have to audit what comes in your mind daily. Look at television. It's the worst, worst thing in the world, in my opinion. You sit down and you watch television. Okay, I grew up in a household where you watch the nightly news. You watch the 6 o'clock news. Well, if I turn on the 6 o'clock news, I guarantee I'm going to see somebody got murdered. Somebody got raped. Some business went under. It's going to rain tomorrow. Like, there's nothing during that 30-minute timetable 
that's going to lift me up. I'll guarantee it. If so, they're using it as filler and it's like a three-minute segment about a dog that got adopted, which is wonderful. But that's not adding value to my life. So I'm auditing that and saying, like, look, that doesn't add value. you got to get out. I'm just, I just don't turn on the TV for the news. Admittedly, in our household, we don't watch TV much of anything. Lindsay and I will watch it from, you know, 9 to 10 o'clock maybe just to wind down and have something in the background as we talk and catch up, cuddle on the couch. But that, that's, that's it. Same thing with the environment you put yourself in. If you want to be a high caliber individual, hang out where high caliber individuals hang out at. That's probably not your local sports bar three nights a week. Just on a hunch. It could be. I'm not saying that all bad people hang out there, but I'm saying more often than not, the caliber of person that's going to elevate your life is probably not hanging out at the dive bar around the corner. If you want something more for your life, you have to act like you want something more for your life. You have to take steps to get more out of your life. You can't keep falling down the same path. And it is in this, as you're auditing your circle, we do something in the Warriors way called the General's Tent. And the General's Tent is, is helping us cut out the cancer. And all we do is on a Sunday, we sit down and we look back at the past week. And we say, you know, did I do everything I could have done? What could I have done better? Did I take my wife out on a date? Did I take my kids out on a date? Did I do something with both of them together? Did I do something for myself? Did I achieve in business all I set out to do? It's a yes or no answer. There's no emotion. It's black and white. It's already over. It's happened. But then you set the, the targets for the next week. Where are you going to take your wife out? Where are you going to take your kids out? And not just some hypothetical high level, like I'm going to take Lindsay out to a piano bar and we're going to have dinner and I'm going to buy her flowers and we're going to go this time. It's detailed because the details matter. And the details around this create the consistency that forces you to actually go through with it. So now on Sunday when I'm done with that, I sit down with Lindsay and say, look, on Tuesday night, your ass is mine. Don't worry about where we're going. Don't worry about what you're doing. You have to be ready at 6 o'clock. I know what that means. At 6 o'clock, my ass is home to pick her up. But that also applies to business. You start setting one major thing you want to achieve for yourself. You take one thing that you want to move from the urgent and important category, or unimportant, unurgent and important category, and you move it over to the urgent and important category. So for me, in my business, it could be sign up a new customer that pays X number of dollars. That's super high level, but I know it matters. But I have to do four things throughout the week to make sure that happens. I'm going to have to cold call one day. I'm going to have to send out emails another day. I'm going to have to follow up on the return emails and phone calls. Then I have to close a customer. There are four things I have to do. And all these things, all these actionable items are what we call the general's tent. You have to audit your circle and audit what you're doing on a weekly basis to ensure that you're going in the right direction. But all that, what happens is we become so cerebral. Like today's society, in my opinion, is incredibly cerebral. You're thinking the whole time, I have to do X, Y, and Z when you don't have to think anymore. Trust your gut. Your gut knows where you should go. It might be scary, but if, if you're working inside a company for somebody else and you know you want to go out on your own and you want to sell the plastic forks we spoke about in past episodes, then fucking go sell plastic forks. Quit waiting. Like the world may need you to sell plastic forks. This podcast is a perfect example for me. I've wanted to shoot a podcast and be a person that affects people's lives for three or four years. I've been incredibly nervous and embarrassed to create a podcast. I thought nobody would listen. I thought nobody would care. I thought the people that did listen or care would only ridicule me. I didn't think there would be any value. Now, deep inside my soul, I knew there would be. I knew if I was my authentic self, some people are going to resonate with my words. But I was so afraid of the ridicule, I didn't do it. And here we are, 38, 39 episodes in, and I won't ever stop now. This is a daily actionable item for me. This is part of what goes into the company. This is something that gives me fulfillment. But it's because my gut's telling me to do it. And if the day comes my gut says to stop, I know now I have to stop. So in your life, when you look at all the pieces and parts of it, you look at your body, what is your gut telling you to do? What is the cancer you can cut out to make sure that you can follow what your gut says? If your gut says you want to be a CrossFit athlete, then go be a CrossFit athlete. It doesn't matter if you used to be a bodybuilder. It doesn't matter if you're a couch potato. It doesn't matter if you're a professional rollerblader. If you want to go do CrossFit, go do CrossFit. Same thing when it comes to your relationship. If you want to stop being an asshole because you know it's wrong in your heart, you can make the decision to stop. It is super uncomfortable to sit down with people and say, I've done X, Y, and Z, and I'm a piece of shit. Telling you from a place of love. Like, that was me. And there's a good chance those people are going to leave your life. But they deserve to leave. And eventually when you have a new clean slate, and you can approach things with an open heart and open mind, you'll find the right person. And same thing with business. You know, if, you're, if your gut's saying, 
to climb the corporate ladder and damn all this entrepreneur talk and just work inside of a company, then it doesn't matter if every friend you have is climbing. If they're all going to start their own business. It doesn't matter what Gary Vaynerchuk or I'm saying or any person you could ever listen to says. Trust your gut. And then cut out the people that tell you something different because they're not going to get you to where you want to get to. And if you start auditing your social circles and auditing your life on a weekly basis and start taking actionable steps towards success and finding a new path for yourself, that's what it means to get shit done. Hey guys, Ryan here. Thanks for joining me today. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please head over to iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume audio and subscribe to 15 Minutes to Freedom. If this brought you value, please do me a favor and drop me a five-star rating. Then share this podcast with someone who needs to hear it. For additional content, head over to ryannidell.com. That's R-Y-A-N-N-I-D-D-E-L.com.